A row of American flags in front of unmarked graves in the African-American section of the Vicksburg National Cemetery. The title of the video appears, Say Their Names, Remembrance and Liberation Ceremony for the Ross's Landing Massacre of 1864. In February 1864, members of a Confederate guerrilla unit attacked soldiers of the 1st U.S. Mississippi Infantry African descent who were on a foraging detail at Ross's Landing, Arkansas. Sixteen black soldiers and their two white officers were murdered. There were only two survivors. The African-American soldiers were eventually buried in unmarked graves at Vicksburg National Cemetery, and the story of the Ross's Landing Massacre faded from history. Today, Vicksburg National Military Park restores their names and honors their sacrifice. I invite you all to join in with me, if you'd like, as we sing the first verse to the, national, to the Black National Anthem. Barbara Harper, a middle-aged black woman in a bright pink coat and heels, stands at a podium on a stage at the front of an auditorium. A picture of flags marking graves at the Vicksburg National Cemetery is on the projector, and a green plant sits on a small table next to her. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the Barbara Harper leaves the stage and the audience sits down. Thelma Sims Dukes, a middle-aged black woman wearing a tan suit, stands at the podium. And the president of the Wilkes Sims Foundation will read the prayer and we're going to read the verse from Let the River Oysting Sing. Thelma Sims Dukes leaves the stage and Charles Smith Jr., an older black man wearing khaki pants and a tan jacket, walks up to the podium. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who hast brought us thus far on the way, Thou who hast by the, thy might fed us into the light, Keep us forever in the path, we pray, Lest our feet stray from the places, our God, where we met thee, Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee, Shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand, true to our God, true to our native land. Amen. 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 Charles Smith Jr. leaves the stage and Thelma Sims Dukes returns to the podium. Welcome. I'm Thelma Sims Dukes, fifth generation great granddaughter of Private William Bill Sims and Judy Boatman Sims. It is a fine honor to be here with you today, honoring and commemorating these African Civil War soldiers of the 1st Mississippi Infantry, Company G, and their two white officers who were massacred at Ross Landing, Chicago County, Arkansas on Wednesday, February the 14th, 1864. Remembering and saying their names is a powerful way to ensure that their legacy lives on. Not only were they soldiers, 
They were freedom fighters, former slaves, had seen the worst of the worst. They were working, they were fighting in a condition of resentment, hatred, racism, lower pay, more fatigue due, used as shock troops, inadequate weapons, and sometimes no quarter as they received this massacre. We honor the ultimate sacrifice by saying their names. Today, after 160 years this past Wednesday, they are never, never uh, going to be buried as unknown. Mm -hmm. Dr. Beck Cruz, the National Park Service 2023 through 25, Andrew Mellon Scholar, has researched the massacre and written an article in the bottom left corner of the screen, the following URL is displayed, nps.gov slash articles slash 000 slash massacre dash at dash Ross dash landing dot htm. Massacre at Ross Landing, which you can see it on your uh, program, the website, which listed to your program. It is a powerful article describing the end, event at uh, Ross Landing. In addition, she has restored the African soldiers' names and regiments and deaths and most of the main grave sites. The first Mississippi infantry company chief was ordered to Ross Landing, Chicago County, Arkansas, to forage on February the 14th. 1864, they were surprised by an unsanctioned 9th Missouri Cavalry band of 21 Confederate soldiers who had voted to go and attack the African soldiers. One of the African soldiers fired off one shot to warn the others of imminent danger. The Africans were equipped with one-shot muzzle loaders. They stood ready in line when the Confederates turned the uh, corner of the gin house. They fired one round simultaneously. There was no time to reload. The Africans tried to retreat. But the mounted guerrillas continued shooting with their coat navy and dragoon revolvers, and they overwhelmed them. After the attack, the guerrilla unit, not satisfied with shooting the Africans in the back and leaving them late, dismounted, grabbed the Africans' rifles with bayonets, and pinned each African soldier to the ground. When the rest of Company G arrived, they buried 13 African soldiers and brought back to Vicksburg seven wounded soldiers, including the two white officers who were signaled out for symbolic execution by the guerrillas. First Lieutenant Thaddeus Cox was shot through the mouth after surrendering and died in Vicksburg. First Sergeant James Spencer was killed in action. Three members of Company G later died of their wounds in the hospital, but two lived, Privates Howard Dixon and Ruthian Epps, until 1918. In March 1968, after the Vicksburg National Park was established, in fact, no, I'm, I'm sorry, cemetery was established, in 1866, the 13 original soldiers buried in Arkansas were moved back to, not back east, were moved to the Vicksburg National Cemetery in the same Vietnam section, section as unknowns. The three who died of their wounds in the hospital were also buried as unknown. The two soldiers, Dixon and, and how, uh, Ruth Young Epps, 
who lived until 1918. Grave sites are still unknown. The white officers, bodies were sent back to their families where they would see funerals, included headstones and inscription. The two officers' families knew where they were buried. They could tend their graves. First Lieutenant Thaddeus Cox, Everett Chiara, bred in part. He died for his country, a martyr to the cause of freedom, a victim to the barbarism of slavery. This is also true of the men we honor and commemorate today. Thelma Sims Dukes leaves the stage and Shellen Wilson, a middle-aged black woman wearing a black dress and boots, walks up to the podium. I am relieved to be a part of this. And when Ms. Dukes called me, I, I was, you know, blown away because I knew about the black soldiers because I've been in the park. I won $75 for, for being a, a tourist in the park. And it's just an honor to be here. I have been under the weather and I just bear with you, but I will do my best to help our soldiers. One day when the glory comes, it will be us, it will be us. Oh, one day when the war is won, it will be us, it will be us. Oh, glory, yes. Glory, and the war is not finished. Victory is won, but we'll fight on to the finish. Then it's all done. We'll cry, glory, oh, glory, glory, glory. We'll cry, glory, oh, Glory, yeah, yeah, glory. Shellen Wilson leaves the stage and Thelma Sims Dukes returns to the podium. My vision is going to be four, five, Dr. Elmer Dorsey Jr. was Associated History Professor at Jackson State University and a former Vicksburger. Thelma Sims Dukes leaves the stage and Dr. Albert Dorsey Jr., a middle-aged black man in a gray suit, stands in front of the plant on the table next to the podium. Good afternoon. I have the privilege to say the names of the first Mississippi infantry soldiers as I pour out the water of libation in remembrance of all of the United States colored troops, USCT soldiers who bravely fought and sacrificed their lives during the American Civil War so that we all may live free. I share. To honor the soldiers after each name, I want you to say, I share. A West African Yoruba word that means so be it. Ashe? Dr. Dorsey lifts a jug of water, and as he reads each soldier's name, he pours a libation of water into the plant while the soldier's name appears on the screen. Private Henry Berry. Ashe. Private Calvin Cathron. Private T. Howard Dixon. Corporal Fleming Epps. Oh, 
private Rakian Epps. Private Peter Everman. Private Charles Thoreau. Private Henry Ford. Private John Jennifer. Private Anthony Gibbons. Private Richard James. Sergeant Tony McGee. Sergeant Noah Howell. Private Thomas Ransom. First Sergeant James Spencer. Private Isaac Stanton. Private Isom Taylor. Corporal Nelson Walker. Private James H. Bolton. A 20th name appears on the screen, First Lieutenant Thaddeus Cock. By saying their names today, we have entered them into the Book of Life. They will never be unknowns again. Ashe? Ashe. Dr. Dorsey leaves the stage and Thelma Sims Dukes returns to the podium. Our seventh generation uh, where the original uniforms did not reach here today. But we're going to move on with our sophomore Bixman High School, Daniel Drake of Plain Tax Bars. Daniel Drake, a black teenage boy wearing an ROTC uniform of blue pants, a gray army service coat, and a gray garrison beret, walks onto the stage holding a trumpet. Daniel Drake leaves the stage, and Dr. Beth Cruz, a middle-aged white woman wearing a black top and white and black striped pants, stands behind the podium and starts a PowerPoint presentation. Good afternoon, and thank you all for your participation in honoring the first Mississippi African defense by pink side soldiers who gave the ultimate sacrifice in the battles of freedom. The first PowerPoint slide is a picture of flags in front of unmarked graves in the African-American section of the Vicksburg National Cemetery. Text on the slide reads, 
Say Their Name, honoring Company G, 1st Mississippi African descent, massacred at Ross's Landing, Dr. Beth Cruz. I also want to especially thank Thelma Dukes and the William Mills Sims Foundation for their continuing endeavors in recognizing the Mississippi and Louisiana USCT, including organizing today's ceremony. My remarks will be brief, um, but I will be around to answer any questions after the ceremony. I want to quickly highlight why I am at Vicksburg National Military Park. For the chief reason a known fellow was placed here was due to the collapse of the African American sections of the cemetery. This catastrophic event brought to the forefront not only the number of unknown USCT buried here, but the overall absence of stories of the African American experience in Vicksburg from the Civil War through Reconstruction. I can testify that the history was recorded. And I am dedicated to reveal the hidden African American history relating to the Vicksburg National Military Park. On my NPS article, which I hope you've all read, reveals the brutality of their death today, I want to provide you with a glimpse into their lives before their fateful day at Ross's Landing. The lives of the enlisted men of Company G, who all joined the U.S. Army about one month after the Battle of Billiken's Bend, is also hard history and unsurprisingly corresponds to a famous set of trading cards published in 1863. The second PowerPoint slide shows a series of 12 pictures entitled Journey of a Slave from the Plantation to the Battlefield. The pictures show an African-American man picking cotton, dancing with an African-American woman, standing on an auction block next to a white man, standing in chains while a black woman and child beg the white man to buy them too, tied to a stake while being whipped by a white man, standing over the white man holding a stick, hiding in reeds in a swamp, celebrating his freedom, crying at the feet of a white man holding an American flag, dressed as a soldier and holding a rifle, falling to the ground with a bullet wound in his chest and lying on the ground covered in blood while a white woman stands over him saying, he died for me. This image is an uncut 12 illustrated cards presenting the journey of an enslaved man from plantation life to the struggle for liberty for which he gives his life as a Union soldier during the Civil War. I'm going to focus on three stages represented by six cards. But first, let me provide a few demographic uh, information about these men. The average age of the soldiers attacked at Ross's Landing was 27. Private Thomas Ransom was the oldest at 42 years old. Privates Isaac Stanton and Henry Ford were the youngest at around 18. Three of the 18 enlisted African-American soldiers were skilled tradesmen. Peter Everman was a carpenter, Charles Farrar was a shoemaker, and Fleming <coughs> Epps was a brick mason. Fleming Epps was also likely serving alongside his biological brother, Ricky. Both Epps's were born in Virginia. In fact, 11 of the 18 were born in the Upper South and were definitively part of the domestic slave trade represented in these two cards. The third PowerPoint slide is a close-up of two of the pictures from Journey of a Slave from the Plantation to the Battlefield, titled The Sale and the Parting. In the first picture, the black man in rough clothing stands on an auction block while a white man stands next to him, waving his hands and talking. In the second picture, a black man stands to the side with manacles around his wrist being held by a white man with a whip. A black woman, presumably his wife, is on her knees in front of the white man, holding up a small black child and begging him to take them as well. The U.S. internal slave trade is referred to as the Second Middle Passage, and it occurred between the early 1800s until the Civil War. The white encroachment on Native American lands and the forced expulsion of the Native Americans meant white planters and slave traders forcefully relocated approximately one million enslaved people from the Upper South to the Deep South. The majority of the first African Americans transported to the Deep South were young, healthy men who were needed to clear the trees for the planting and harvesting of cotton. The Second <coughs> Middle Passage ripped families apart. Henry Louis Gates Jr. recognizes that it was during this period that we think of the image of slaves being sold downriver on the auction blocks where mothers were separated from children, husbands from their wives. <coughs> The years between 1830 and 1860 were the worst in the history of the African-American enslavement. Two-thirds of the men killed or wounded at Ross's Landing 
survived the second middle passage. Fleming and Ruffian Epps are also representative of another aspect regarding the institution of slavery, the sexual exploitation of the enslaved. Scholars estimate that 58% of all enslaved women between the ages of 15 and 30 were sexually assaulted by white men. Ruffian's military records are incomplete, but Fleming's <laughs> death record records reports his complexion as brown. In total, five of the 18 enlisted men included <coughs> variations that explicitly imply white male lineage. What is often overlooked is the sexual exploitation of the men. Not only did the enslaver produce offspring with the enslaved women, he chose which enslaved males he wanted to pair with the enslaved women. These men's early death ensured that no records for them or whether they were forced to participate in slave marriages and create children against their will. But we can presume some of them were coerced into sexual relationships. On January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which allowed for the inclusion of African-American soldiers. The fourth PowerPoint slide is a close-up of two more pictures from Journey of a Slave from the Plantation to the Battlefield titled Stand Up a Man and Make Way for Liberty. In the first image, the black man, wearing ragged pants and no shirt, kneels at the feet of a white soldier holding a large American flag. In the background are rows of tents. In the second image, the black man is dressed as a soldier and holding a rifle with a bayonet. Behind him are scenes of fighting. Contrary to the narrative provided in past scholarship and represented in this card, the black man was not groveling for inclusion. The activism of both free blacks in the North and the enslaved people in the South forced Lincoln to respond to their demands with his proclamation. Free black men argued and petitioned for their right to join the fight for freedom. The enslaved people who could not petition the government took extreme risks and self manumated um, themselves by running away to Union lines. And contrary to the lost cause of loyal slave myths, these men were not coerced into joining the U.S. Army. They had choices. Some of those choices were to join military service and remain on the now U.S. government-controlled plantations as wage earners. Many chose, chose the U.S. Army and took pride in claiming civil rights as citizen soldiers. The men of Company G also demonstrated their abilities to be leaders of the U.S. Army. Bolden, Fleming Epps, Everman, and Walker were corporals at enlistment. McGee and Paul were enlisted as sergeants. Private Howard Dixon, who survived the event, mustered out as a sergeant, while Corporal Bolden likely struggled with surviving the massacre and was demoted to a private. He did possibly die of his raw slimy wounds in 1866. Ruffian Epps, once he healed, served for the Ranger of the War as an orderly at the Ranger Bell headquarters. The survivors, Ruffian Epps and Howard Dixon, applied for military pensions. I plan on obtaining them in the future, and this will likely reveal more details about their service and the massacre. I do want to note that this research on this massacre is ongoing. As a matter of fact, the other day I discovered some more information, and I will be updating um, the website in the coming weeks. The fifth PowerPoint slide is two more close-ups from Journey of a Slave from the Plantation to the Battlefield, titled Victory and He Died for Me. In the first image, the black man is dressed as a soldier and holding an American flag. He is falling to the ground with a bullet wound in his chest. In the background are dead men and other men fighting. In the second image, the black man lies on the ground covered in blood. Victory, personified as a white woman wearing an American flag and holding a wreath, stands over him. To be sure, the USCT held no misconceptions about the cruelty of the Southern men, and they were completely aware of the slavery supporters' rhetoric regarding their fate should they be captured on the battlefield. Approximately 100,000 African American men enlisted in the United States Colored Troops of the Secession States, even though they faced the threat of ex execution for servile insurrection. The deep range of Southern soldiers <coughs> encountering the African American soldiers resulted in Civil War massacres like Ross's Landing. The fury also carried over to the white officers. <coughs> Lieutenant Thaddeus Cox and First, uh, First Sergeant James Spencer 
were denigrated before their execution. The officers were stripped of their uniforms, <coughs> forced to kneel on the ground, and shot at the head at point blank range. First Sergeant Spencer died on the field. His body was brought back to Vicksburg to be shipped home. Lieutenant Cox suffered for days and force of coming to his head wound. I'll also know that they stole lieutenant, the lieutenant's saber, and it is out there somewhere to this day. And if he break with his name, should we ever find it, we'd like to have it back. But this was the price that the white officers paid for the Confederacy claim who was exciting servile insurrection. In conclusion, the U.S. soldiers of Company G, 1st Mississippi Infantry, African descent, gave the ultimate sacrifice for the nation, not just for their freedom, but for the freedom of nearly 4 million enslaved African Americans. The sixth PowerPoint slide shows a flag of the 3rd United States Colored Troops. It depicts a black soldier and a white woman in a white dress, both holding a United States flag, and says, Rather die a free man than live to be slaves. For these soldiers, it was not abstract ideology. They knew what it was to be unfree. And even though we do not know what the 1st Mississippi Infantry African Descent's flag looked like, there is no doubt they too believed in the bottom of the 3rd USCT. They were to die free men, the lived to be slaves. The seventh PowerPoint slide is a picture of the African American portion of the Vicksburg National Cemetery with small American flags planted in front of unmarked graves. So now, 160 years later, we can acknowledge the victims of Ross's Landing. And as President Lincoln remarks of the Gettysburg dead, we too can recognize the men who lay the hallowed grounds of the Vicksburg National Cemetery and never forget what they did for freedom. Dr. Cruz leaves the stage and Thelma Sims Dukes returns. Now we have Bill's George Flags. He's sure to say a few words to us about Big Spur. George Flagg Jr., an older black man wearing a gray suit, takes the stage. Say the names. You know, some of them read what Dr. Martin Luther King said we're not makers of the history were made by history. Somewhere I read and it's always right to do what's right to Miss Dukes and to all of you that are here today. I have witnessed something. As may have this city, I'm so honored and proud to stand here for you today to witness this true story. My daddy could not read and write, and he would send us to this park. And that's my relationship to this park, to read monuments and come back and tell him. Yeah. Well, daddy, I can no longer say I know. I can give you those names that read here today before me, as mayor of this city, I can do that. Thanks to you for the research. You know, I text out this morning that knowledge is power, and it is. And I say that to you, Mr. Dukes, I say this to your organization, I say this to everybody. It's today, it's the beginning. Of oh, history will never be told like this before. We see in the Mississippi legislature that gave us $10 million to acquire some land. The Con Bill, an interpreter, some uh, about $107 billion right here in Pittsburgh. So, you know why? So, we can tell the full story, not the whole story, but the full story about what happened. Next year, 2025, we're going to celebrate Pittsburgh. Birthday. And we want to celebrate in a way that never been celebrated before. We want the old story, the full story, to be told right here. And we still do have a, a place at the table. A place at the table. Because you, because of your steadfastness, because of your braveness, have stood the test. Time. And you 
for the research, and I feel too pain for you to have to do what you did. And Dr. Douglas, then for you to be those things, you didn't be experienced. And I'm so honored to bring you greetings from the mayor of Fort Lauderdale of the city of Vicksburg and say to you that this is a new beginning. George Flagg Jr. leaves the stage and Brendan Wilson, a middle-aged white man wearing a National Park Service uniform of green pants and a gray short sleeve shirt takes the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. And, uh, on behalf of the National Park Service, I could just say how humbled um, I am to be here and how honored we are to be able to help support peace. But also say on behalf of the National Park Service that we are committed to this type of programming, this type of research. We are committed to saying that these stories will not remain unforgotten. That we will tell this whole story, that we will continue to restore the names of others. And when we tell these stories, we're doing something more than just honoring their deaths. Because if we all take a moment to think about our loved ones, about ourselves, when we define who we are, we're not fully defining ourselves by our moments of death, but it's how we live. And so today, we're not only honoring that these men made the ultimate sacrifice in the fight for freedom. We're also celebrating these men's lives and what they did while they were alive. These were men of action. As Dr. Cruz said, they had choices in life, and they chose to take action and make a difference. They chose to say, that they would rise above the oppression that they were constantly challenged and they struggled with. And so today, as we continue this effort to tell these undertold stories, again, we're not only honoring that moment when they made that ultimate sacrifice, but everything they did to carry on this quest for freedom. And it brings to mind the words of another US Army veteran from Mississippi, Medgar Evers, when he said, you can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. And through these men, Ross Landy, the idea of Leo continues on. Gordon Wilson leaves the stage and Thelma Sims Dukes returns. The Wiggy Museum's foundation and the presenters of this program and the African community thank the Vicksburg National Park for this opportunity to commemorate our African Civil War soldiers. We thank the Park Service for this new direction in acknowledging the omissions by confronting the realities of the past, by inserting the African soldier's history into the narrative of the park. Special thanks to Superintendent Harry Mordock, Chief Interpreter was just out, Brendan Wilson, Dr. Bess Cruz, she's our researcher. <laughs> Thank you very much to figure some spirit of scholarship. Is John, come on down. He's the one who's taking care of our disinterred guys that they had to, disinterred soldiers that they had to repair the terraces and their grave sites. And he's watching all of these guys. I don't know how many he does. He'll tell me about it. What's the name again? Here's the John. John Schweiker. John is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I thought someone go. 
Thelma Sims Dukes leaves the stage, and John Schweigart, a middle-aged white man wearing a National Park Service uniform of green pants, a gray long sleeve shirt, and a tie, takes the stage. Well, Thelma, thank you so much. It is an absolute honor to be here with all of you, and I will keep my, my statements very short because you've heard some very eloquent things from our co-conspirators, as my colleague Brandon Wilson would say. Um, but I want to talk about the divine contract as a starting point. And what I mean by that is every one of us in this room, all of these individuals buried in our national cemetery were given this divine contract. We were given this gift of life. Many of us here have had many decades of life to cherish our loved ones, to enjoy a sunset, to have a wonderful meal with friends. These individuals from Ross Landing, their lives were cut short, very short, but they still were given that gift of life in that contract for one reason, the same reason every one of us is held to, and that is to make a difference. And so these individuals were buried. Their identities were equally bare, but they have come back and they were bringing a charge to us. And that charge, again, is to make a difference. And as Dr. Cruz mentioned, we are all here because of a reason. And it's a reason, again, brought to us, brought to us an obligation that when that landslide fell, in those two sections that were designated for our United States colored troops, that was then issuing every one of us a calling to be responsible. That is why I am here. I was brought in to manage that project, but I cannot do that. There are, at this point, getting quite close to 100 individuals or more that have been systematically disinterred from that cemetery since April of last year. And that has been done by archaeologists working through the heat, working five, six days a week, dealing with rain, dealing with complexities that typically archaeologists do not have to deal with. And so I want to give a special recognition to my colleagues from Chronicle Heritage who are here for their continuing work. <laughs> And to add to this is that we are honoring these men from Ross Landing, but this story is much, much broader. And the individuals that are being systematically disinterred, we are looking at the whole breadth of the human being. We are looking at men of fighting age. We are looking at adult women. We are looking at children. And we are even looking at individuals who did not have the opportunity to be born. They are all coming to light from this work in the cemetery. This is extremely moving. And the stories they are being given to us are not what people associate with the veteran cemetery. So history is not only something that has happened at Vicksburg. History is happening in Vicksburg right now. And to keep this story going, there needs to be flame people. People who hold that flame and are committed to passing it on to the next generation. And that is all of you in this room. That is everybody. You were brought to this ceremony for a reason. Whether you just heard about it five minutes ago or you have devoted your life to telling the story. But either way, every one of us has an obligation that the next generation is going to carry these stories forward. There has been too much sacrifice too much that has come in the way and prevented this from being at the forefront. Because quite frankly, the Vicksburg story does not make any sense without the role of the African Americans who were lock, stock, and barrel central to everything that happened here. And yet, park service, you see the park, that is hard to see that. But we are moving in a positive direction. We need to keep that plane moving forward. So as the mayor mentioned, the 125th anniversary of the existence of the National Park is coming up this week, on the 21st of February. There was a conscious effort when that park was created to exclude the African American story from it. For the next 125 years, we need to reverse that. 
we need to put that African American story right at the center where it belongs. And so all of this, in my opinion, centers on the concept of heritage justice. It is not the park's role to be the purveyor of this information, to decide what stories get told and what doesn't get told. What we need to do is accept our role as co-patriots, and we need to let that voice of the people of Vicksburg and the communities here be the center stage. And so as you go forward, realize you are a flame keeper. You have a role to play in passing this generation on to the, or this story on to the next generation. Um, because this really is the only way we can let that significance of Vicksburg shine in its true light. So I'm honored you are all here, and uh, this is probably one of the most important things I have done in my life, and I hope it is important and dear to your souls as well. So thank you. John Schweigart leaves the stage, and Thelma Sims Dukes returns. Thank you so much for coming, because this is one of my proudest moments, too. Uh, Margie, that wasn't bad either, John. Um, we did a little program where we disinterred the African soldiers. Thank you for coming. Closing credits. Beneath the National Park Service Arrowhead logo, it says, Special thanks to Vicksburg National Military Park. William Bill Sims Foundation, National Park Foundation, Mellon Foundation, www.nps.gov slash vic.